Hey guys, welcome to Remnant Radio. My name is Michael Roundtree. I am hosting the episode today. Joshua Lewis, my normal co-host, who normally leads from the spot. He's doing a, a podcast in Arizona with Cultish. He's also been preaching there. So uh, anyway, but we are live today with Amy Bird, who just wrote a book called Recovering from from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. We're curious about that provocative title. And we're going to talk all things manhood and womanhood and the content of her book. And I can't wait to introduce you to her. But I do also have joining me uh, Michael Miller. And, uh, and so Michael Miller is on the other line from Denver. Michael normally joins us for our To Be Continued, uh, to be continued episode. And so, Michael, how are things over there in Denver? Probably like snowy. You guys are like snow skiing right now, just like hitting the slopes hard. <laughs> no, there's no snow yet. <laughs> Actually, that's not no, that's true. How, we, we that's how we in Texas view everything, like in Colorado. Like it's year-round yeah, snow. Yeah, it's it's actually a big kept secret. I'll let the cat out of the box here. Cat out of the bag, not box. Uh, <laughs> we actually get more sunshine than most cities in the country. I think we're just below like San Diego. Stop bragging, uh, dude. No, nah, it's true. Hey, tell so, them a little bit about clearly superior uh, years, Michael. <laughs> Tell them a little bit about what Remnant Radio is and what we have coming down the pike. Yeah, so we're a crowdfunded uh, podcast. I, I, we call it radio, but really we do YouTube and podcasts. There's no actual radio frequencies going out uh, with this uh, show. Uh, but, you know, we've got a bunch of the pipelines. Tomorrow we got a uh, uh, show with Shane and Shane that will be airing around 3, well, I guess 4 p.m. your time, 3 p.m. my time. And then on Wednesday, we're going to pick up our series uh, on the Welsh Revival. We'll, we, we kind of got cut off last week, only about 35 minutes into the episode. So we're going to finish out that content and talk uh, specifically about practical application, what we can learn from that revival, and what the Scriptures have to say about any kind of move of the Spirit. And so excited about that one. That will be on Wednesday uh, on our normal To Be Continued, where you normally see me. So uh, there's that happening. And what else am I missing here, Michael? Well, oh, uh, uh, subscribe, click the yeah, button hit the, down there, <laughs> hit the subscribe button for sure. And he mentioned uh, that we're crowdfunded. So if you've benefited from our content, we'd love for you to consider donating on Patreon or PayPal. Patreon, you get exclusive content for as little as five dollars a month. Uh, and uh, so that's monthly. And then uh, PayPal is for a one time donation. But all that inf information is just below uh, in the description of the YouTube of the YouTubes. Um, and also just want you guys to know, uh, just one more thing about Remnant Radio is that we, we interview uh, people of every position and we're about to interview uh, Amy Bird. And so we're actually gonna ask, are you egalitarian or complementarian? So there are varying positions on this issue of women in the church and women in the home and just womanhood, womanhood generally. So we're gonna talk about all of that. And we interview people across the spectrum on this issue as well as every issue. We're talking Anglicans, Baptists, Charismatic, Cessationists, everything in between. And so if, if you're looking for a podcast where you can just learn and bust outside, as you say, as we say, of our theological echo chamber, this is the podcast for you. For, so definitely hit that subscribe button. But without further ado, uh, uh, Amy, we're so excited to have you joining us from Maryland, right? So um, yeah. Yeah, if you could take a moment, just introduce us to yourself, and we'd love for you to also tell us uh, a little bit about your book, Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Sure. Okay, so my name's Amy Burr. I'm 45 years old, been married for, oh man, going on 25 years, and I have two daughters and a son, and they're basically all young adults now, which is pretty crazy. Um, I have a 22-year-old in graduate school, and that makes me feel really old. Um <laughs> I love the outdoors. We have some uh, pretty mountains, not as big as those Boulder Mountains, but um, we have some nice Thank mountains you. and rivers around here and good hiking on the Appalachian Trail. Um, so love doing that kind of stuff. Um, spent a lot of time in my life doing like self-defense training. My family, my dad taught it my whole life. And now my brother has a clinch academy, which is like a mixed martial arts and Brazilian jiu-jitsu wow. academy. Do you have a black belt? Son. I do not. I never took it that seriously. I mean, not that um, it's like not an accomplishment if you're only like yeah. a not black belt, but. <laughs> right. No, I never took it that serious, but I've always kind of been around it. And, um, you know, I kind of geared more towards like the women's self-defense, 
uh, and fitness kickboxing and stuff like that mm -hmm. in my adult years, which has been kind of fun because while my son's doing jujitsu and mixed martial arts, I get to do that. So that's kind of something I do for fun. Um, I am a writer. Have you, have and you had to speaker. use those defense skills? Actually, the funny thing is, you know, with my whole family being, you know, brought up in that, I was the one that really had to use it more. And that wasn't in, in college wow. one time. So, yeah, it was wow. definitely helpful. But, you know, part of it, too, is such a mental way of it's a way of thinking defensively, mentally, too. And so I think that that is a huge part of why I wouldn't have had to do it as much either. Um, being with some of my girlfriends, I remember you know, going out with girlfriends and then parking by like the dumpster in the dark yeah. <laughs> by the woods. He <laughs> thinks like that. I'm like, we can't just, just looking for trouble by the dumpster. <laughs> yeah. So. This is where trouble can be found right here by the trash. Yeah. And it gives you a confidence, I think. Um, and, you know, I think that that shows in my writing, especially particularly one of my books, Theological Fitness. I get to kind of use that metaphor a lot. But um, yeah. I think that, yeah, that way of thinking kind of shows forth in my writing a little bit, too. So um, Recovering from Biblical Manhood of Womanhood is my fifth book. And my books kind of have built off one another. Um, I began writing, my first book was published in 2013. And so I was, you know, younger then. And I was really just trying to explore, like, how you know, how women can grow as disciples in the church, because I was noticing that it was very lonely for the thinking woman, um, that she wasn't invested in the same way. Um, our expectations as in discipleship were different. The materials, um, the resources for women's ministries, um, I was finding were very unsatisfying. Um, and some of them were just plain full of error. And so um, my writing has kind of, and then I, I noticed too, even more so as I began speaking um, in mixed settings, that uh, the men are kind of afraid of the women a, a little bit. Um, there's this whole uh, mindset that we are a threat to their purity. So um, that whole Billy Graham rule kind of on crack, I say, mm -hmm. for leaders in the church to where, you know, at one point I found myself um, in a city at night in the rain, and I had had to park several alleys down um, and where I could have been given a ride to my car, um, I was not because I was a woman and that wouldn't mm. look good. So here I am no. walking to my car down the sketchy alley at night in the rain, coming back from a Christian speaking event, <laughs> you know, oh. under this whole banner of male protection and headship, right? And thinking how angry my husband would be to know that not one person offered me a ride. Wow, I, I don't, can't it, couldn't decide whether that's that. couldn't decide whether that would be more painful or offensive, but probably both. Um, yeah, and these were friends, so it was uh, it was it was, a, it was very dehumanizing. Um, and so, uh, and I I didn't feel very secure anymore. I ended up writing a book about friendship between the sexes because of that. And, um, you know, our status as brothers and sisters in the church and how uh, Paul addresses us that way more than any other way, um, exponentially more than any other way. And what does that mean? Uh, looking at ancient siblingship, how they would interpret that and, um, you know, what it means to promote one another's holiness, you know, what friendship really is. Yeah. So there's just different layers that I've had to address just trying to be a thinking woman in the church, like somebody who gets to also participate in the theological heart and intellectual life and creative life of the church. Um, and so that, you know, made me have to step back and ask a lot of just really basic questions too. Like what is a disciple? Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, it, it seems like all the talk in evangelical circles is focused on what women can do and what women can't do. And if women can teach it or not, um, if women can be ordained or not, um, on both sides, on the complementarian side and on the egalitarian side, um, where my questions were more oriented towards, you know, what is a disciple <laughs> um, and what can a disciple do? And, and what is the actual meaningfulness behind our sexes? Mm -hmm. And how okay, would so that you, enrich the whole picture yeah, in Christ church? And we definitely want to want to talk about all that. And I, I, what I'd love to do is sort of work through the, the argument of your book and kind of 
finish, especially on the on the cultural side of how people define masculinity and femininity and how that plays out, maybe in certain situations, like you mentioned the Billy Graham rule. And so getting practical, especially toward the end of the episode, you mentioned t- two theological terms, complementarianism, which speaks of uh, male headship, uh, at least in the church and in the home, and sometimes beyond that, depending on which complementarian you're talking to. Uh, (laughs) And then on the other side, you have egalitarianism, which says uh, that when it comes to authority and submission, uh, really there's mutual submission between the sexes, and so uh, women can do all the things. And so you have the complementarians and egalitarians going like this, and I I wanted to... uh, to just read a quote and where this is going is we, we want to know what you are, Amy, um, because, <laughs> because in your book, you, you do say that you affirm male, uh, male, it sounds like male ordination, male eldership in the church. Um, so it, it sounds like you affirm that, but then you, you quote a lot of egalitarian authors and, um, and seem to sympathize with that position. But I want, I want to, uh, at least some, but you kind of have criticisms for both sides. Here's the quote. Um, While evangelical egalitarians agree on distinction between the sexes, they often downplay these distinctions and empty them of their meaning. Women in egalitarian churches feel just as undervalued because even though there is an ostensible consensus that man and woman are equal, the work hasn't been done to acknowledge the enrichment that distinct feminine and masculine contributions bring to the church. On the other hand, complementarians often set up femininity and masculinity as something to strive for in itself. There are no exhortations in Scripture for men to be masculine and women to be feminine. Okay, if there's any degree to which you want to unpack that quote, great, and maybe <laughs> dovetail that into. Tell oh us yeah, what you, there's a whole book of unpacking. You, so let me yeah. figure out, you know, the, which way I want to go with that. But um, okay, well, well, just tell uh, us. Uh, uh, okay, it sounds like you're about to start, so go for it. Yeah. Okay, I can start off by maybe disappointing the listeners and that I really don't like these labels. Um, I don't think they're as helpful as they could be anymore. Um, and they're fair, fairly new. I mean, they're movements really. Um, so it's only been for like the last 30 years there's, that there's been something called complementarianism. Um, and then the response from the council for biblical equality and, and egalitarians, um, And I think that there's really good points on both sides. Um, I hate that we've become so polarized and this has become such a battle in the church because I think that um, there's a lot of dialogue that needs to happen. We need to sharpen one another. We need to grow and learn. And so that's where I'm trying to uncomfortably be (laughs) is is reading widely. I, I am in a church with a tradition where they affirm Um, ordination of qualified males only. And I want to emphasize the word qualified, because when you look at the qualifications for an elder um, and a pastor, not many people meet them. And so often you find in the complementarian setting, um, a lot of the teaching is that men have this kind of authority by nature, by being men. And so it, it qualifies them to do so much more in the church just because they are men but they don't really have those qualifications and we're we're not really asking the bigger words like the bigger questions like what is it what kind of authority is this it's not just some blanket authority where they can tell people what to do but it's an authorization for something and really they're authorized to be the first to love the, the first to serve and the first to sacrifice so i think that there's a lot um a lot of other questions that we need to ask besides just are you a complementarian or are you an egalitarian? So I, I'm not a complementarian because there are too many errors taught in that movement and I don't want to identify with those. And okay. I'm not quite an egalitarian either um, because I still think there's a lot to work through on the distinctions um, and how that represents Christ's spousal love for his bride during worship. Yeah. And when you say errors taught in that movement, um, are you intending like people who are teaching, like, like, is there working out what does masculinity look like and what does femininity look like? Like, as they kind of spell out these different nuances that that's the problem. Um, would you say though that, because I I can imagine a complementarian saying in response, well, like 
hey, we, we get it, and we agree a lot of complementarians go too far in defining, like, literally every human interaction that anyone might have, down to the mailman, down to anything, and you, and you mentioned that one in your book. Um, so, hey, we agree some complementarians go too far with it. Um, however, what do you think of, like, complementarianism if we just go with just the, the pure sort of historical view of the church, if we want to take that as an example, that maybe hasn't worked out all those details. Uh, it, well, and... first of all, um, complementarianism, its foundation, you know, at, with the Danvers Statement and the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, um, from the very beginning, um, and my title kind of is tongue-in-cheek on this, because they, you know, put out this, this book about 30 years ago, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And in this book, there is serious error. There's error of first order doctrine on who the son of God is. Um, they teach in the book an eternal subordination of the son, that in his essence, um, he has this functional role that is connected to eternity to submit to the father's authority. And this is just anti-Nicene. It's unorthodox. Um, they use that teaching then to teach that somehow there's a leap that therefore women in, in, the, in our ontological role, which role is you know, something you play. It's a word that comes from the theater. Yet they're using it as like this fixed ontological thing um, that we are subordinate to male authority. I mean, you can already see the problems that are going to come from that. Um, so that's pretty serious error taught right in their key book that then so many other resources have come out from. Um, and then there's this hyper masculinity and hyper femininity um, taught throughout the book where we're told to put on kind of male virtues and female virtues. You don't see this kind of division in scripture between male and female vir virtues. What does that even mean? And so then it does play out in the book to be these odd things like women need to be careful in strength training too much because we need to remain soft looking so our feminine needs will be met. <laughs> uh, you know, it just gets weirder and weirder. So there are some valuable things in the book. And that I think that's what makes it so hard because um, there is a lot of good stuff in the book. And then it maybe makes you not question some of these serious issues that are in it that have been damaging to the church. So um, I can see some of the error there, like especially with the <laughs> jumping to these rash conclusions about what masculinity is and what femininity is based largely on our cultural arguments rather than on scriptural ones. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I can understand where you're going with eternal subordination. Um, I think the, the tough thing is like, so when I think of like, I mean, use this by way of analogy, uh, progressive Christianity, when you try to talk to somebody about inerrancy of the scriptures it's like trying to nail jello to a wall like they, <laughs> they don't answer the question and so i'm kind mm -hmm. of curious you've given some of the errors of uh complementarianism that you see as it was originally defined by that group um mm -hmm. what are some things that you would say on both sides you actually agree with like uh, that we could for sure go oh she's here on this and here on yes. this. yes so i definitely think that um, god's design for man and woman is beautiful and there is a distinction there. And that is going to show some when we're uh, together in worship, when we're in our households. Um, and, I, and I do think that there's something to like, why is the man called the head of the home, you know, uh, of the wife? Uh, that's a question worth exploring. I don't think we should just downplay it. I think we need to look at what that means. Um, and then along with the egalitarians, I also agree that there's mutuality in marriage. I don't think that... Um, Headship means that the man gets the final decision or that he gets to tell his wife what to do all the time, um, which is what a lot of complementarian teaching boils down to. Um, so I think that both sides want to give us as a witness, as the church, an answer to the beauty of our design. Um, both sides want to do that well. And I think one positive thing about the complementarian side is that they're really trying to combat, I think, a lot of what we're seeing in the culture with the sexual revolution. And we've got these major questions about marriage between a man and a woman. We've got sexuality questions. We've got, um, you know, we're still really um, suffering from all this abortion. Um, how do we 
how do we address all that? How do we give a good argument um, and a good witness? I would like to say that we need to we need to show the true beauty behind it, um, and and that's what's that's sorry about my dog. <laughs> my husband's that's coming fine. home. <laughs> but we need to, I think, present what's beautiful, and um, I don't see that in even in the Danvers statement. Um, you know the way that they use the word roles. It's not even in most English translations at all. This word role, but that's all we talk about are these roles all the time. And so I, on the egalitarian side, I'm very sympathetic to that argument. And the egalitarians were the, the first ones to critique this complementarian teaching of ESS, eternal subordination of the sun. And they were completely ignored for years because they were just cast off as liberal. Huh. Now, um, Gosh, there's so many things I want to touch on. Okay, well, um, let's come back to uh, let's come back to headship. You mentioned male headship. You okay. affirm male headship in the context of elders. Now, this is maybe uh, of the arguments that I've seen uh, complementarians make uh, that the parts where they do not like your book. Okay, where they or where I should maybe put it like this: they disagree with. Uh, with how it was done or, or whatever. Both are true. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I think the biggest thing that I hear is you, you didn't tackle the most central complementarian text, First Timothy chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul says, I do not allow an elder to, or sorry, I do not allow a woman to uh, teach or to have uh, exercise authority over a man. Then he goes into, gives two different reasons for that. And so, uh, and so they would say, you, you didn't tackle First Timothy 2 uh, that speaks of male authority. Uh, maybe you didn't drill into Ephesians 5 headship where it, where it talks about, uh, you know, a woman's submission being as to the Lord or, or, or uh, anyway, they, they would quote a, num a number of passages, but I think centrally it would be 1 Timothy 2. And, and so obviously this was, this was a choice you made as an author. You have a choice about which passages you address and which ones you don't. You did address 1 Corinthians 14 about women being silent in the church. Uh, churches, and that is a difficult text, but you opted not to do these. Um, so two questions. One, why did you not, uh, why did you not address First Timothy 2 specifically? And two, what is your interpretation of what Paul's saying there? Okay, I'll answer those, but only if we get to go to Ephesians 5 after. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Let's come back. Sure. To okay. So I didn't address either of those in the book for the reason that my book is written about discipleship, not leadership. And it's interesting because, you know, every interview I do, every critique that comes, all the questions are about what does Amy think about leadership? Um, but my book is written actually with the audience of church leadership in mind to please lead some discussions about what discipleship looks like in their church. So, so um, it's a plea in a question. lot of ways. So, you know, I didn't address First Timothy 2 because that's about leadership and I'm writing about discipleship. I didn't address Ephesians 5 because that's about marriage or that section of it there that everybody wanted me to talk about. And I'm not writing a book about marriage. I was writing a book about discipleship. So I did address the First Corinthians 14 because that was a picture of disciples in corporate worship. Okay. All so, right. Well, that's so then my we'll start. So there's your, the first one. <laughs> And then, so and, next, what is your interpretation of First Timothy 2, specifically yeah. when the Apostle says, uh, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man? So how do you take that? And I think I, I'm going to be unsatisfying in this answer, and I'm not trying to be jello, I promise. But um, I, I feel like I have a lot to learn still um, about that passage. I've read a lot of commentaries on it, and I've read some pretty plausible stuff on both sides. Um, and so my argument for um, male ordination is not really based on this text. I think that we can have a, a broader argument that doesn't have to all, you know, rely on First Timothy 2. Um, this word authority is the only time it's that Greek version of it is used in all of Scripture. And when you look at the way that it's used um, elsewhere, it's a very violent word. Um, it's like even associated with murder. So um, it definitely carries with it something very aggressive. Um, what does that mean? Why did he choose that word? 
Um, he's writing within the context of false teaching. There's a, you know, women are really involved in that in this church. Um, I think the contextual questions and answers here, there's just a lot going on that I don't feel like I have the, all the answers to it. Okay. Sure. Um, so that's so where I the, am with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on the, it, on uh, specifically it sounds like that word exercising authority is is where some of it as well as you mentioned some uh some cultural things with with women kind of usurping in that in that kind of context so yeah i mean it's like you know this usurping of yeah and so it's not even just usurping of authority it's just like of the person you know yeah. um it's 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 a violent word, really. So I right. find that but really interesting. But you haven't, and right? But you haven't gone fully to that egalitarian side because you are still affirming male, male eldership. Yeah, I don't think what that are the our... what are the compelling sort of traditional interpretations of First Timothy two that still are are kind of pulling at you on that one? Yeah. Um, well, I would say that the best version is that here Paul is talking in the context of corporate worship, and so the the complementarian, I think, you know, the, the better ones are saying that this is saying that, you know, women can't step into that role in corporate worship um, yeah. as an elder or a pastor. Okay. And that he's not talking about the broader discipleship in the church. Okay. And so even, you know, really conservative denominations, um, you know, even in the OPC can take the stance that, okay, well, he's talking about corporate worship here. Um, but he's not talking about teaching Sunday school. Yeah. Okay. So you wanted to take it back to Ephesians chapter five. We're going to let you do that now. Yes. <laughs> Cause I think that Ephesians five is really where my, um, you know, my greater argument would come out. And first of all, though, and it's not this cut and paste that you see on the two sides either. Um, but the command is to be filled by the spirit in verse 18 and so then he's kind of explaining what that looks like. And um, he says in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Then he moves on to wives and husbands, and he says, wives, to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, most English translations add another submit there just to make sure we know. <laughs> but it's not there in the Greek. <laughs> it just says, wives, to your husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Now, he, is, he says this little bit to the wife. Now, it's important that he's talking to her, because usually in these um, household codes, it's only the paterfamilias who's being addressed, only the man. Um, and this time he addresses the wives and the children as well. So all of a sudden, we've been given a lot more dignity um, to, to listen to this word ourselves, which is beautiful. Um, this word head, I mean, there's different interpretations of what that means. Um, uh, you know, a lot of egalitarians will say, well, that word was used a lot to mean source. Um, and so he's the source, like Adam was the source of Eve. Um, and I think head is representational because um, Adam was kind of the head of mankind, right? He was a representative for all of us. Um, and so when he sinned, it was Adam's sin that, you know, led to the fall because he was um, this representative. He was a federal head over mankind. So I think that there's a representational aspect there. Um, and then he moves on to husbands. Now, the section written to the wives is like that big. And, you know, the section written to the husbands is like all these things that he needs to do. Mm -hmm. And instead of what, you know, you would think that they would hear in this time period um, that it's so patriarchal. Um, and because of the, the fall, he doesn't say husbands rule over your wives. He says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Um, and then he goes and shows how um, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by, by the word. This is what Christ did for his bride out of love, okay? Um, so in the same way, what is, here's my argument. Our sexuality is rooted in eschatology. It's not rooted in nature, which so many people want to teach. And so we go all the way back to creation, and I think Paul is alluding to this here. Um, man is created first. 
woman is created second. What does that mean? Um, does it mean that woman is subordinate to man, like complementarians want to teach us? Um, or does it mean something different? Man is made from the soil of the earth, not woman. Um, there's a way that he kind of represents earth, is connected to earth. Um, woman is made from the side of man, and she's created second to represent typologically the second order. Um, and so when woman is made from man's side, we get this picture. Well, first of all, he had to sacrifice her. Um, God puts him to sleep. It's like almost like he had to die. Um, and he makes her from part of man. And so he, we're, we're getting this picture of the church flowing from Christ's side. And so when Adam looks at woman, he sees what he is to become, what he is beckoned to as the collective bride of Christ, all of us together. And so we see this heaven and earth uniting, which is, you know, what we have in store for us in the future. So I think that our sexuality is very meaningful. And I think it tells a story of Christ's spousal love for his bride, who he left the holy realm. Um, and we get that picture of man is to leave his father and mother to cleave to his wife and unite to his wife. That's exactly what Christ did for his bride. So that story is being told here in, to the point where Paul says, this is a great mystery. It's profound, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. Um, so he's telling us of this beautiful picture that our sexuality tells, our bodies tell, and that's an important picture. And so all these ways the husband's to love his wife, he uses, he repeats himself like four or five times that the husband is to love the wife. Um, as much as he loves his own self. And so I think that is also a form of submitting to one another. Um, this is how you're to do it, husband. You're to be the first to love. It's an order of love. Um, the masculine is the first to love, the first to give, the first to sacrifice. We see that right in the picture of creation. We see that in Christ. And so woman represents in her typology kind of this realm of ascent where we're headed and the bridal people, the bride. And man in his typology represents the means of how we're to get there, the second Adam, which is okay. based on sacrifice and love. Miller, what so, are you thinking? Well, I mean, a lot. Uh, I, I don't want to. <laughs> I know it's a, I, I have, I have a questions about some of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have questions about some of that. I don't think I want to get into it right now, just because I do want to. I do want you to walk us through the argument of your book. Uh, you you start okay. off in the Old Testament and you move into the New, and I, I want you to, to to spell that out for our, our audience. Okay. Um, well, what I'm doing in the first part of the book is I'm really just, I want to take, kind of take a step back and just think about the whole way that we read Scripture. Um, and I want to highlight something because Scripture is kind of androcentric, and it's male-authored, um, and it's written in a very patriarchal time. Um and so women, it's very interesting to think of how women didn't have access to education in the same ways. You know, most people didn't have access to reading even. Um, but it's amazing when you l actually look at the woman's voice in scripture written by the male writer and how it's used. And so I kind of build off of Richard Bauckham's work and his book, Gospel Women, where he talks about how the woman's voice functions in a way that kind of interrupts and um, it kind of interrupts in a way that unsettles you and to where you're going to take a step back. And it's because you're about to get a different perspective. You're about to see with different eyes. You're going to see a lot of the time um, the, the invisible being made visible, the story behind the story being told um, from the woman's perspective. And the very interesting thing that this attests to then is when we when we hear stories about, you know, Shipra and Pua, uh, the midwives that in Egypt or um, Rahab, when we hear or Ruth, when we hear from these different women, how do those stories get in there? It's because they were handing down, they were sharing their story. They were tradents of the faith as well, and that they passed down their story of God's faithfulness in their life, and it was heard, and it was recorded in the word of God. And so we see this um, dynamism between male and the female voice, and we see uh, the fruit that comes from it, and it's synergetic. And so I think that that is something really fascinating to look at, and it's, it's really um, encouraged me as a woman reader. Yeah, and, and I guess the term for that was gyno, gynocentric interruptions. 
Yeah, and so this Balkans ter- term, and it's kind of a funny one to say, gynocentric interruption. It's, it's the woman, and it's kind of Keep like the gospel, like too. feeling like I'm talking like, about a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> she's interrupting the, t- the male androcentric text. And um, it is funny. Like, my husband, he, whenever I use, like, any bigger academic terms in conversation, he, he likes to help remind me of who I really am. And so he starts using those words jokingly uh, in different ways that aren't really appropriate <laughs> throughout the day. It sounds <laughs> like something I would do. Doesn't oh, do the right man. thing. And uh, so he had a lot of fun with gynocentric interruption. Oh, man, <laughs> and then funny. one professor I was talking to about it, he made the joke. He's like, oh, my goodness, like, I just realized my whole life is a gynocentric interruption. He has three daughters. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, I, I am a complementarian, and, and you know that from conversation, Amy, and our, and our uh, kind of regular viewers know that. But uh, this was a part that I, I really uh, enjoyed in your book and the way that you talked through the book of Ruth and some of these women figures. And I just, I guess it hadn't really, I had not thought deeply about the fact that as you pose the question, this could have been called the book of Boaz, but it was called the book of Ruth. And then you have yeah. a book of Esther. And just how insane that is, that in such a patriarchal culture, God would actually have books of the Bible named after females. Now, mm-hmm. I love that because, you know, mm-hmm. as a as a complementarian, I, I'm totally game. Like, let's let's affirm there is a huge value in the female <laughs> voice. And, and that was another part that I, I liked. I, I, I mean, I just, I like reading a female voice. So it, it kind of, yeah. most theological books I have, let me be honest, they're not, they're not by females. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, and so hearing some of your experiences, like for instance, you talked about, uh, one of the things you talked about was that on the Trinity discussion, we probably should revisit that one too. Mm-hmm. Um, when uh, I didn't realize that you were the one who, like, the blog, you were the one who, like, started it. I pulled the rope, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, in terms of the eternal subordination of the sun debate. So uh, for those of you guys who aren't aware of what eternal subordination of the sun means, it's this idea that Jesus uh, sort of... Uh, in eternity past has submitted to God the Father, and it's been an authority submission relationship in eternity, uh, whereas, say, Nicene uh, Orthodoxy would more teach that uh, in the Incarnation, yes, Jesus uh, submitted, and Jesus, uh, in, in kind of in the scope of redemption, but, uh, but it wasn't a thing of eternity past. The way it relates to gender roles uh, specifically is some complementarians, certainly not all, uh, but some complementarians have have said like, hey, just in the same way that God the Father is Jesus' boss in eternity past, uh, (laughs) husbands get to be their wives' boss. Now, no one says it in that vulgar fashion, but it's essentially (laughs) that argument. Well, so, no. but it plays out that way a so lot Amy, too. So, yeah. Amy, you you raised the flag on that and said, "Hey, this is actually against what all the church fathers wrote throughout history." <laughs> and talk to us about um, how your argument was received when you first made it, and kind of what changed that. Oh uh, yeah, and and this is kind of also an answer to your question earlier about you know, what about those guys who say, like, not everyone in complementarianism upholds ESS? As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't. And not everybody goes to these hyper-masculine teachings. Um, What happened, first of all, is that I knew I couldn't be the writer of the article um, because I would just be ignored. Um, So I asked Liam Gulliger, who is a pastor at 10th uh, Presbyterian in Philadelphia, um, big church. He's got a lot of respect as a pastor scholar. Um, he w- I was kind of showing some resources to him about just how pervasive it was in men's ministry, women's ministry, children's ministry. Um, and he was appalled at, um, at all of it. The new, the, the president of CBMW at that time had a new book coming out that was just full of it. And it was all to teach about men and women. Um, so I talked him into writing, an article for my blog and I didn't think, you know, I didn't know what would happen, but I did not expect the explosion that happened. I actually cut it into two articles because he wrote, it was pretty long for a blog. Um, but what happened after that is like responses from some of the major proponents. Um, and then 
thankfully, some other complementarians uh, started joining in as well, saying, yeah, this is wrong. And it got to the point where uh, the patristic fathers weighed in, saying, this is not Nicene teaching. Um, and now books have been written, conferences have been had, and seminaries are thankfully changing the way that they're teaching the Trinity because of this. Um, but to back up and answer this question, that was in 2016. Um, this had been going on for almost 30 years. So, um, well, at least 20 or so, yeah, close, over 20 years, 25 years. A couple decades, two, anyway. Why wasn't anybody saying anything? If, if the complementarians don't believe this and really think that it was that bad, like, you know, to get the Trinity wrong, um, why were they endorsing the books, major names, sharing platforms on these major conferences, um, and endorsing the very books that have that teaching in it. Mm -hmm. And if these people don't have the same hyper feelings about masculinity and femininity, same thing. And why, when I sp spoke out about it um, and tried to do it in a friendly way, do I get completely blacklisted and a lot worse? I've gotten a lot worse than that too, but the, in a the more sophisticated way, blacklisted. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I want to, I'm going to ask you, Sorry, Miller. I'm asking one more question, then it's your turn, Miller. <laughs> um, okay, so we, we have somebody uh, uh, in the chat. Prager Frogger is his name. And he, he, wants to, he wants to talk church history here a little bit. He says, we can't condemn eternal subordination of the sun because it's against early church, but completely ignore that all early church authorities taught male-only church eldership, husband leadership, female head covering. So in other words, uh, the... the and he didn't pose this as a question, but he, he's, he's coming back. And I, and I want to ask this because there are complementarians watching this show, and they're going to be asking the same thing. They're going to be saying, okay, so we're going to Nicene Orthodoxy, we're going to church history, and we're trying to say, like, hey, based on church, uh, based on church history, these complementarians got it wrong when they're recommending eternal subordination of the sun, ESS, okay? And so we're making an argument based on church history there. What would you say to the complementarian who says, but you seem to be uh, discounting church history whenever you make some of the arguments that you make in your book about whether it be, um, hey, women can teach teach men, maybe at least sometimes or, or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. where you're making sort of arguments against complementarianism. Well, the church has historically been complementarian. So, so what do you make of the church history argument? Well... First of all, my argument isn't just a church art history argument. It's a creedal argument. It's what Christians have been confessing um, since the Nicene Creed. So that is a, a distinction. It's historical, but it's creedal, um, which I think is very important. Secondly, I'm not making an argument for female ordination. However, and I would say in church history, that's mainly what we see as male. Um, and, you know, we didn't. Ordination wasn't even a thing, you know, in the early church. You know, that became a, something that happened in history. Um, so if we want to look at history, we have to also look and see how women have taught and how women have served. And there's plenty of works coming out on that now that's really, you know, good historical work showing that, um, you know, women's agency a lot of the time depended on a lot of different uh, social and cultural factors and, and class factors as well. So, um you know, we can look right in scripture and see women being called co-laborers. We see them being called deacon, whatever that means. It's huge. Um, we see Phoebe being trusted as the envoy of the letter that Paul is having sent to the Romans. We see women planting churches, hosting churches. Um, so maybe the way that what we're looking at what authority is and ordination is, and we're just putting everything in that basket and we're not seeing all the life in the church where men and women are teaching one another, leading one another. We see women correcting, you know, male leaders in scripture. Um, it's all there in, in the Bible and in church history as well. So I don't think it's as cut and paste as we want to be able to make it. So there's a, a lot of directions we can go with this. And I'm, I'm a little tempted to just ask you now if you want to come on another episode so we could talk about the practical implications. <laughs> I did want to say one, and, and one things... more thing is in, Go ahead. in church history, and I um, kind of document this, 
men, male leaders in the church have said very misogynistic and horrible things about women. We got, you know, from Augustine <laughs> um, to Chrysostom to uh, the reformers, um, you know, about woman being defective man. It's Aristotelian philosophy about woman being defective man. Therefore, that's why man can't learn from her. So the church from early on has started picking up on horrible um, anthropology, I guess we should say, and philosophy about who woman is. And so that does need to be corrected. Well, and I, it sounds like to me that's exactly what uh, what you see in Genesis. You know, uh, he will rule over her. That's not necessarily a good thing. That's actually no, sort of a result yeah. of the fall, not necessarily something God ever intended in that in that way. Um, uh, Amy, it but, sounds like you're persuading uh, I, Michael. <laughs> I, I'm not quite persuaded I yet. I mean, you know, we're just kind of looking at this whole picture, right? Yeah. I, I do have a lot of practical questions, and I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get to some of these implications now. Uh, what you mentioned about having to have somebody else publish your paper that was a man. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not surprised. Right. Like, I think there's there's... For you to be taken seriously, you had to get somebody else to put the paper forward, uh, and that's actually kind of a shameful thing. And I, I'm, I'm curious to know in what other ways we've seen these biases play out in uh, our orthopraxy of, of uh, specifically complementarian and egalitarian churches. Um, those who would, you know, subscribe to both of those camps. Um, I imagine you've got a lot of examples, and you've probably picked up That's on a, a lot, lot more as you've begun to talk about these things. Is that would that be accurate? Yes, and you know, even after that exploded, um, it was just like, okay, Amy, now take a step back. I still, I was never interacted with on it. So, it, you know, Christianity Today even wrote an article called "The Women Behind the Trinity Debate." Hmm. Wow, it's like that. What's that? Uh, the movie about the African American women who were like behind a lot of the NASA calculations. Oh, right, yeah. right, yeah. Hidden figures. It's like that. <laughs> you you were a hidden figure, Amy. So <laughs> of, of the females. So uh, okay, well let's uh, let's talk about uh, just let's talk about gender a little bit. Okay, so masculinity, femininity. You argue that there is a difference. Complementarians will a beautiful clear difference. Or complementarians will real clearly uh, delineate that difference. One of your criticisms of egalitarianism is this is it's kind of unclear and nebulous and can cause uh, problems for women in the egalitarian church. It does, so yeah. so let's land on where how do you define masculinity and femininity and the role that this plays in discipleship? Mm -hmm. I don't I'm not sure if I have like a definition as far as like masculine, you know, it's biological, obviously, is the first place that it's given yeah. to us. Um, God created man Biblically, and, it's biological. and woman. <laughs> he, yeah, he created male and female. Um, so that's pretty basic. But, you know, as I was getting into earlier, you know, I really look at this as a typology, too. Like, that our bodies are telling a story of Christ's spousal love for his bride. And that's why exclusive marriage between a man and a woman is exclusive. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and differentiate differentiated it tells the story of creator created uh visible invisible um you know there's all these binaries that, that it does share it does tell that are beautiful um christ can't marry himself the church can't marry herself and so you know i think marriage is telling this great story and you know you look at uh the bible and right smack in the middle of our bibles is a book that not many preachers preach on it anymore. Um, it used to be preached on like crazy. It used to be a book that theologians would go to to help them answer some of the harder texts in the canon of scripture. Um, it, it was like a hermeneutical tool. And that is the Song of Songs. And um, today, you know, I think in the postmodern age, it's been interpreted more flat footed as a book about sex, marriage, or virginity. Um, but, you know, for most of church history, it was interpreted as an allegory of Christ's spousal love for his bride and the individual believer. And Israel, the Jews interpreted it as uh, God's love for Israel. So um, there's so much going on. Uh, I really do a lot of work in the song in my next book, The Sexual Reformation, where I really do get into this whole meaningfulness behind our sexes. Um, but 
it, we shouldn't be surprised because the Bible begins with a wedding. The Bible ends with a wedding. Um, we've got the major prophets all talking about God's love for his people in bridal terms, like Ezekiel, Hosea, Jeremiah. Christ's first miracle was at a wedding. And then we have Paul in Ephesians 5 telling us about this allegory, this great story that marriage tells, um, that man tells in his sacrificial love for his bride, um, of Christ's sacrificial love for his bride. And he even alludes to the Song of Songs in that uh without spot or wrinkle because in the song you have Christ or you have the bridegroom saying to his bride you are absolutely beautiful my darling there is no imperfection in you there's no spot um and you even have you know over and over again you see these intertextual references and allusions and echoes in the song with both um old testament and new testament and I just think it's absolutely glorious and beautiful. So I think that there is a, you know, a distinct meaningfulness in our sexes that our bodies tell. It will then um, answer so many of these other questions. I think complementarians, um, you know, want to, they kind of wag their ethical tails ahead of the dog, <laughs> the theological mm -hmm. dog. Like those ethics are important, but why are they so weighty? Why is something like same-sex attraction so weighty? Why is abortion such a weighty issue? Um, why is pornography so bad? Um, you know, these questions I think are really important questions, but when you get to this meaningfulness, um, then the answers become so clear. Hmm. Okay. And I think we can also help one another as we see like, um, suffering, you know, people are suffering <laughs> yeah. and we, I think we can come to that more in, in this already and not yet time that we're in then. Okay. Hey, Miller, I, th I thought you had a follow up on that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned um, the, the Song of Solomon being used as a hermeneutical tool, and you say that's been done th all throughout church history. Do you mind just giving me a couple of uh, examples of that? Not that I disagree that that's how it's been used. Well, Origin and Gregory of Nyssa, and then like really in the medieval church, um, the song was, you know, regular. I have a whole like journal article where it's just shown how over and over again it was used as a hermeneutical tool because it it's kind of a uh, microcosm of the whole meta narrative of scripture. Mm -hmm. So when you have that that story and concentrate, um, then you start to see all these little treasures in it of all these echoes in the different parts of the canon. Um, and of course, because it's the canon written by one divine author, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. We shouldn't be surprised to see that. Um, the Song of Songs was actually called the Holy of Holies of Scripture mm -hmm. by Origen. Um, I think also by a rabbi. Yeah, it's, it originated from rab a rabbi. I don't want to get his name wrong. Um, uh, was like this Adam rabbi? We did, a, we did an episode on this with um, no. Tremper Matthew Longman. The, we did an episode with Tremper Longman the Third on this in the springtime. Uh -huh. Uh, I think it was called God and Sex or something like that. You guys can go, you you guys can go watch it. He does take a more like it's about sex, romance, and that and that kind of thing. Yeah. But he does quote the rabbi you're mentioning, and it's right it's I think too. around the first or second A.D. Uh, or okay. first second century A.D. Uh, is and is they when were that is. debating whether the song really right. was part of the canon. But yeah, so he takes it. Uh, he, he does take it, now he does understand it typologically as pointing to Christ and the church, uh, but he does take mm -hmm. it about being most directly uh, about love and sex. But uh, anyway, so you guys make it's sure you go back too. and listen to that episode. Yeah. But um, it is interesting in the Song of Songs, though, the, uh, or the Song of Solomon, alternatively, uh, it is interesting to me the way the woman is so much the aggressor in it. <laughs> you know, she, like Her voice that is would, dominant. That it would not be allowed the in the way sometimes femininity is portrayed uh, amongst mm -hmm. complementarians. And twice uh, the bridegroom beckons her voice. He says, let mm -hmm. me hear your voice. That's the last yeah. thing he says to her. It's evangelical, yeah. I think. Hey, Amy, I, I'd like to ask you about, uh, so blind spots in the church for male-led churches. So there are going to be mm -hmm. uh, some people who are viewing, and you talk about this in your book, but there are going to be some people viewing who they're like, okay, I'm, I'm not convinced by the arguments. I'm still complementarian. But I didn't take from your book that your your goal was necessarily to persuade every egalitarian or no, complementarian to agree goal. with yeah. you. It seemed to me like what, uh, the major or one of the major goals of your book was to sort of appeal to complementarians, like 
listen to women, see women's voices. I think this is a blind spot in the church. Right. And, and so could you just speak into that? Appeal yeah. to your I'm never going to be convinced complementarians. <laughs> how can uh, how can a complementarian better hear female voices, specifically in church contexts? And, yeah, and maybe I mean, in marriage, think, too, <laughs> for that matter. Yeah, I'm especially, I think, I'm, I'm trying to talk to both um, both poles, <laughs> complementarian, egalitarian, but I'm the target audience, really, of the book, um, even though there's definitely a secondary audience of, of anyone interested in this topic, but I really kept in mind the audience of church leaders, whether they're in a complementarian setting or an egalitarian setting. Like, I myself am in a complementarian setting. I'm not telling people get out of there or, you know, totally change your mind. I'm saying, let's, let's look at what, it, what is the product of the preached word in the church? Like what is overflowing out of this ministry of word and sacrament in the, uh, the brothers and sisters under the household of God. And I want, so I have questions at the end of each chapter and I would love to see churches doing this as a study group where the church leaders are actually leading the discussions, saying, like, this is our church's um, stance on these things. You know, they probably have statements on it already. Right. But um, how can we better invest in the women in the church? Um, are we loving women like Jesus loved women? <laughs> um, does our church look like Romans 16, which is this beautiful snapshot of ministry in action of men and women serving together? Um, and, and these bigger questions of what does a disciple do? How do we invest in them? Do we invest in women disciples differently than we invest in male disciples? Um, are the women in our church part of the theological, creative, intellectual heart? Um, are they being invested in? Do we value them in that way? Um, and it would be great to have a co-ed setting where women are able to share their experiences in the church in a safe space. To, and where they're listened to, because in these male led churches, um, you know, you guys who are the elders, you get behind. You, well, first of all, pastors, you, you're going to seminaries where you're with mainly men. You're taught by men. You're reading books by men. Um, I was invited to speak at uh, RTS in D.C. on a preaching and communications class on the topic of preaching to women, because that preacher professor who is older now, but he said he was five years into his ministry before he realized that he really wasn't preaching to women. He didn't even realize it, you know? And so what can we do about this? Um, because Jesus loves women. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, God loves women and pastors should love women and, and leaders in the church should love women. And when you get behind the doors, closed doors and make all your decisions, are you ever inviting in the women's perspective? Are you ever asking how the preaching is um, how the women are grasping the preaching, you know, do they feel like they're being preached to as well? Um, do they feel like their contributions in the church or so often I hear from women feel like that they're threats whenever they try to contribute, that they have to be managed all the time. Um, let me, let me, you ask don't you have that perspective question. unless you ask. So, uh, this, this is a, it relates to my own history here as a pastor in Denver, I remember there was a, a very attractive young girl who uh, had aspirations for ministry, really feel, felt like that's where she was called to teach the scriptures, to, um, you know, display the gifts of the Spirit and all of those things. And she very much wanted me to disciple her. And there was this, um, you know, real difficulty I had in knowing how to... Uh, uh, contribute to her Christian growth as a disciple of Christ, but also maintain uh, a boundary that would be appropriately appropriate culturally speaking. And, uh, you know, I'm a married man, um, want to protect mm -hmm. my, my marriage at all costs. and all good uh, things. Well, not at yeah. all costs, but, but yeah, yeah, all those things that, that <laughs> we want to have as, as men. But how would you respond in that situation? Well, and, and also, I remember women... Uh, felt very threatened, especially wives felt very threatened because she was a very attractive girl. And, and so that plays into that. And as a, you know, my wife has never been the, the jealous type or anything like that. So it wasn't so much an issue there. I'm super thankful for that. Um, but I could see how that played a part in uh, this woman feeling very rejected and very uh, ostracized and not really mm -hmm. giving, being given what, what Christ would desire for her. And so how would you respond to that? What would you say? How would you encourage people like myself and others? 
Right. I mean, it's so great to be sensitive to that and ask these questions and, and realize the vigor that this woman had um, to grow and to want to serve God in that way. Um, and I think, you know, you can even step back and ask the question, does discipleship look like one-on-one -on -one all the time from the pastor to the disciple? Um, I, you know, I think not necessarily. Discipleship mm -hmm. is going on all the time in the church. And, and I think that we're not equipping congregants well enough to help in discipling one another because it is our great honor and responsibility to be a part of that. So, um, you know, you could even look at your church and say, this woman, okay, she is already showing this theological vigor and this wanting to grow. How many other women in the church are like that? Let's get a group together. Um, you know, you can start doing small group stuff with people and, and every now and then meet with them individually and see how they're doing. If you think there's an appropriate time to do that, I'm not saying don't do that, but it doesn't have to be just you building a relationship with this woman, but actually helping the whole church in um, preparing one another in that way. And there's going to be some who are going to kind of grow more in that theological direction and be teachers in the church. And um, how can we equip them together to then teach other people to teach? Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, uh, this is about the time where we uh, where we wrap things up. And uh, Michael, I'm going to, in a moment, give you a, a chance to kind of share a closing thought as well uh, as you, Amy. And so uh, first, I get to share my own closing thought. And, uh, okay. and I think I would say, I, I think for me, the biggest thing is, uh, is that women, women need a voice. And that's yeah. regardless of whether you're a complementarian church with a male eldership or, uh, or you're egalitarian. I mean, if you're on, if you're egalitarian, you, you've already accepted that premise. So maybe I'm speaking mostly to, to complementarians here, but, um, j just imagine. I'm not an egalitarian. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know you're not. I know you're not. So, yeah. um, but I, I'm just, I'm kind of speaking to viewers now. So oh, I, you. I'm, I'm simply yeah. saying that, that women, uh, women have a voice and it should be valued and it's to your detriment that you don't listen to her husbands how many times have you not listened to your wife when she was right okay just ask <laughs> pilot's wife about that okay so uh <laughs> listen to in fact in in our elders meetings i mean we'll, we'll all get together we'll talk about whatever it is but when we have big decisions and you know sometimes it happened in the early days when i was i became a senior pastor in 2012 and I uh, came home from an elder meeting. Yeah, we made such and such decision. And, and my wife was like, oh, dang, that wasn't the greatest decision. <laughs> and then it turned out the other husbands went and talked to their wives. And all the wives were like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the best. <laughs> and so we actually, you know, kind of started like, okay, here's our tentative decision. But we need to uh, let's uh, – we'll actually invite our wives to, uh, to just kind of – I mean, as any, I think, husband or wife in a healthy marriage, you'll kind of talk about things, right? Like, um, but we ask for we ask for feedback, and that's not like we do that for every decision, uh, but we do. We definitely do it sometimes, and um, and we we welcome uh, women's voices. So I, I just think that it's important that you create those avenues, uh, as well as uh, treat treat women as intellectual. E equals. It's not like only men can exegete scripture and women just don't know what they're talking about. And it, I don't know. So I just think some of our stereotypes are, are overdone to the detriment of women and we need to, we need to be willing to listen to voices. Miller, what, a what's your closing thought? Yeah. Um, I would say I'm not, I'm not super convinced on the typological argument, although I, I definitely am interested and I want to hear more on that. And so I, I realize that, that, that there's more investigation needed for me. Uh, another thing is I, I am recognizing that you're opening the, the or you're asking some, some of the right questions uh, regarding what are the roles that women uh, play in the church and how can we better empower them uh, rather than continue to to hold them back from all that Christ has for them. And so uh, those questions, I think, uh, I, personally, I feel uh, the need to investigate further. And I'm actually very thankful to have uh, you challenge some of the pre-existing pre practices in the church, uh, because I do think it's going to make us look more like Christ, right? It's going to sanctify the bride of Christ, to use uh, the term we've been using earlier. So I, I'm very thankful to have you on the show for that reason, and uh, I would definitely love to continue the conversation, and I'm going to look more into your uh, resources. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Amy, yeah, any, any any nuggets you want us to walk away with? 
Well, I want to pick up on what you said about the woman's voice being important. Um, Diane Langberg uh, writes about, you know, three essential things that are essential to our humanity, just as human beings. And it's voice, relationship, and power, you know, agency. Mm -hmm. um, and so often women can't find this in Christ's church. And that is so sad. Um, it's, we should be modeling that um, to the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that's so important. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more that needs to get unpacked on that typological argument than I gave in two answers. So I hear you on that and I'd love for you to look into it more. <laughs> yeah, but, um, I really would. Yeah, and then lastly, I just wanna say that, you know, I'm still learning and growing and I, and I ask a lot of questions in the book. Um, I want to kind of ask all of us to look at this topic with a, a bit of humility. Like, you know, I. I could have some things wrong in there for sure. So um, I don't think people are going to agree with all of my interpretations. Um, sometimes I even say, hey, I'm using some uh, kind of historical imagination here for this part. But, you know, we all do that when we read scripture. So, you know, I'm just kind of admitting it. Um, so I feel like we need to have these conversations. And I, I feel like I did with you guys today. Like, thank you for the humility that you've shown and just asking me these questions. Sure. Absolutely. Well, it's an honor to have you on the show, Amy. We look forward to your next book coming out. And, uh, and just want to say to all of you guys who are viewing, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Great show coming out tomorrow uh, with uh, Shane Bernard and Shane Everett, also known as Shane and Shane. Uh, great discussion. We've actually already had it, so it's going to be uh, Josh and I talking theology of worship we actually went to their studio and filmed them in person so a lot of you guys are familiar with them if you're not you need to check them out but uh anyway so that's going to be tomorrow and then michael and i will be back on wednesday talking gifts of the spirit and specifically welsh revival practical implications or sorry applications of that for us and so we'll kind of work it out in everyday church life what that looks like so uh ex excited uh about what's coming down the way so uh thanks so much for joining us this week Love you guys. Appreciate you. Thanks for all your great conversation in the comments. So uh, we'll catch you next time. Have a great day. God bless.